Joseph day job is training the next generation of outstanding teachers. Any Roehampton people in the room? Ah, oh, too far to the west, I suspect, but it's nice to... Oh, hello. Sort of. Sort of Roehampton person. It's nice to have you here. Right. Um, what I'm, I'm not going to so much talk about the computing curriculum, which is what's been taking up much of my time over the last couple of years, um, working with the Department for Education in, in developing that in England. What I want to do today is far more interesting than talking about what we teach. What I'm interested in talking about today is how we go about teaching that. There's a quite a lengthy lead-up to the last sort of 10 minutes or so where we'll talk about pedagogy. Because I want to start first by talking about information in more general terms and then talk a little about education more generally before we get into the sort of pedagogy bit here and then eventually we get to the digital pedagogy bit at the end. And I'm having trouble with the funny clicky thing, but um, we'll try once more. Ah, digital literacy has that for you. And I'll just stand here and press the button. So firstly, in terms of information, there's a view that what life is about is passing on information to the next generation, specifically the information that's coded into our DNA, the genome as something which we pass on to, uh, to the next generation. I'm not going to go into detail about how we do that, passing it on to the next generation. But there is this sense in which all life is about the information that's coded into our DNA, which describes us as at least an organism, and that all life is about passing on that information. But what sets us apart as a species from the rest of life is this sense that we have language there, which lets us pass on information far more effectively. Now, if you think back to your teacher training days and the Piaget idea about learning for experience, which for many of us is so, so important, what we did as a species, I don't know, a million years ago, 600,000 years ago, I wasn't around at the time, was come up with a more efficient way of passing on information than merely having to have that experience yourself. We can tell one another about that. And okay, you can talk to me about dolphins and chimpanzees and some birds having some form of language. But that's not the sort of language in which you can write Hamlet. It really isn't. And that what we do then is code that experience into language. Much, much more recently, again wasn't around at the time, say 6,000 years ago, we come up as a civilization, as a species, with a way of encoding that language in a form which allows it to be communicated without having to be physically present in the same room. Yeah? At the moment I'm talking to you, most of you listening to me, that's great, thank you very much for that. But what we could do is capture this in writing, we could do a transcription of this, and then you could pass the ideas on here if you wanted to, to anybody else, because we've invented writing as a way of encoding that language in a form which will, which will exist in multiple places and in multiple times. Those tablets which the Babylonians and Assyrians wrote 6,000 odd years ago, we can still visit the British Museum or the Louvre and see those now and decode what they were talking about. Okay, much of it actually is, 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 is um, invoices and accounts. And then, again, more recently still, was this about 50, AD 1500? This sense that we can <coughs> distribute that far, far more efficiently than ever we were able to do with the stone tablets or the papyruses or the parchment or the manuscripts by coming up with a machine which will make copies in that day and age printing press rather than photocopy. But you have then a mechanism of taking one piece of writing and making multiple copies of that so that the information is no longer locked to one physical artifact but can be spread far, far, far more effectively, more efficiently. At the time, of course, the control of this process in the hands of the elite, the printing houses, the publishers, those who gave authority for the book to be printed, for the book to be bound, for the book to be distributed. We move on, and you get to 25 years ago, and Tim Berners-Lee having this idea of a way of making that distribution far more democratic, using the power of the internet, making it possible to transfer a document from one computer so efficiently, so seamlessly, to any other computer 
connected to the internet. We call this the World Wide Web. I was around by that point, but not using one of those back in you know, 1989, as it would be. And this democratizes the whole thing, doesn't it? That any of you, more to the point, any of your pupils, can publish their ideas, the information that they have, gained from their experiences, gained from their reading, to the world that a child in a primary or secondary school today can write something with an audience of potentially two and a half billion <coughs> other people. When I was at primary school, indeed secondary school, the only person who ever read my work was my teacher and maybe my mum. Okay, it was put on display, but nobody ever read that. And now we're at the point where a primary school child can have that global audience. But there are implications for scale there. The illustration at the top is what you would get if you printed out the whole of the English Wikipedia. What an amazing achievement for us as a civilization to produce that, to crowdsource that encyclopedia, summarizing what we, as a group of people, are connected to the interweb thing. No. Printing that out, 10 big library stacks of Encyclopedia Britannica size volumes. What an amazing achievement done for free, given away freely. You can download it. You can go onto the Wikipedia website and say, could you give me the whole thing, please? And you, get a, you can get it a zip, in a zip format, or you can get it uncompressed. The uncompressed Wikipedia takes up, what is that, 10 big library stacks, or 44 gigabytes of data. 44 gigabytes of data fits on a micro SD card, which is about the size of your fingernail. Assuming you've got normal fingernails, don't know. Okay. Isn't that just astonishing now? There's something like that. So a 64 gig card, what's that, 40 quid or so these days? You've got room for the whole of the English Wikipedia on there and the whole of the German Wikipedia in uncompressed format, if that's what you want. So this, you've heard, I'm sure, about Moore's Law, the notion that the technology that we have, the speed of the process and the number of transistors on the chip doubles every 18 months or so. The same applies to storage capacity, and if your hard disks are anything like my hard disks, they're pretty much full most of the time. And so if we do that together, what you have is this result that the amount of information we stored in the last year and a half since November 2012 is the same as the amount of information we as a species had stored since the beginning of time that we're creating so much more content, day in, day out, and storing that. It's cheaper to store your photos than to delete your photos. Paying somebody the minimum wage to delete photos is more expensive than buying the extra storage to keep those photos. Now, we've got to that point. Okay, the problem is that most of the new stuff is videos of cats playing the piano on YouTube, but that apart, we have all that information there at children's fingertips. And part of what we should be doing as educators is yes, teaching them to discern in their access to that and discern in how they're using that, but also to be adding good new stuff into that base. I want to do a similar sort of survey when it comes to education. And this wasn't painted at the time, this isn't photographed, this is Raphael's depiction of the School of Athens, or one of the first academies, I suppose. And what you have there is this sense of a group of people meeting to talk about ideas. Think back to my thing about language. Think also to my thing about writing. And isn't this at the heart of education, of bringing people together to share their ideas, to share information with one another? And it's interesting that we do already, you know, by the point Raphael's painting this, never mind what actually happened at the School of Athens, have educational technology involved. I'm sorry the picture's so small. Well, actually, it's quite big, but it's just a long way away, isn't it? We have Plato and Aristotle here with books, this sense of preserving the information for the future. My favourite bit of the picture is down here, bottom left-hand corner. This allegedly is Pythagoras, and Pythagoras has got a book here, again, preserving information, but it's his pupil who's got what looks to me an awful lot like an iPad, and he's saying to Pythagoras, have you seen the latest education technology here? And this gentleman here, I think that's possibly the Estin or Ofsted inspector just taking notes on how that conversation is going. How's that going to be graded? We'll see. 
And then we move perhaps from this great, you know, Athens, democracy, all of those ideas, approach to education to one which is much more about cultural transmission. A group of people sat in a room listening to somebody talking about a set of ideas. Does that sound at all familiar to you here now? It's really interesting comparing and contrasting what's going on. Yes, we have a few people in the front row, thank you all very much, listening very attentively, but there's an interesting conversation happening at the back of the room over there. And this gentleman, I think, had a much better night the night before than he's having that morning, don't you? Um, those of you who are working with, with, with perhaps older students might recognize some of those types from your classroom. But there, because of the writing thing, because of the publishing thing, there are other places you can go to learn than coming into a room and hearing somebody talk. Think of the difference between learning in a classroom or lecture room or conference room and learning in a library. Think about how much control you have over the direction of your study when working in a place like that, when learning in a place like that, rather than in a place like this. And, you know, the web does so many of these things. Yes, it's a way we can all be present with one another and learn from one another, but it's also there as the repository of all of that information. Um, at Roehampton, we're a collegiate university, like a couple of others, and I work at Froebel College, named after the great German 19th century educationist Friedrich Froebel, who, amongst other things, invented the kindergarten, which is a pretty cool thing to have been working on. That's a nice project, yeah? Let's, let's go and make kindergartens. And here is his, uh, or here is a painting of a 19th century German kindergarten. Have a look at what's happening in the painting. This has an awful lot more in common with the School of Athens than the medieval lecture room, don't you think? Of the conversations, the learning through experience. The two, um, we would call these, I guess, practitioners these days, don't seem particularly involved in directing learning. I worry a little about how Eston Ofsted would regard the learning that's taking place in an environment like that. But it is a place where we connect learners with one another, a place where there is so much potential to learn through experience. This is different. And okay, 19th century English classroom, or possibly American classroom, can't tell just by looking, you have very much that medieval approach of the expert passing on ideas to a group of people. And that, there are that, there's that tension between these two different approaches to education. Is it about making, putting people in contact with one another and sharing ideas? Or is it about coming into the room and listening to the expert here? Of course, these days, you don't go to, or well, your default place for going to learn something new is not the classroom. Unfortunately, it's not even, well, I think unfortunately, but I'm sort of old-fashioned in that respect. I think it's not even the library anymore. Where do you go to learn something new? It looks an awful lot like the place behind me on the screen, I suspect. I want to find out about Google will put us in touch with that. Is Stuart in the room? Okay. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't use Google as their default search engine? You've really got to worry about that, haven't you? Okay, I, I'm a great believer in Google. I think they do very, very good things. But if they were to use their powers for evil rather than good, we'd have to all be ever so slightly worried about that. Other search engines are available. If Stuart were around, he'd be able to mention one to you. Anybody who thinks it stands for because it's not Google, you may be onto something there. Okay. And how do we access this? You no know, longer need the physical connection. You, know, you have the device like this. It's not as transformative as the web. Of course it isn't. It's not as powerful as Google in terms of connecting you to ideas. But the fact it's always with you and it's your device is tremendously empowering. Any of you done the surveys? How many of your pupil students have a smartphone of their own that they can use pretty much when you want? Anybody done the survey? This is not merely a rhetorical question. Okay. How many? Uh, 90. 90. 94%. Have a smartphone. What age students are you working with? 11 to 18. That's hugely impressive. Do you let them bring it into school? Sorry? Do you let them bring them into school? Um, we're currently going through those negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> Watch that space. A gentleman to go and have a chat with at uh, coffee time, I think. Somebody else, another hand went up towards the back of the room. That's astonishing, isn't it? I was hearing the story the other week of a class of reception children, five-year-olds, 
many of whom had their own BlackBerry. Absolutely astonishing, don't you think? People still using BlackBerry. Amazing. <laughs> so what does this mean in terms of teaching? Well, just as we still do pass on our DNA to the next generation, just as we still use language, just as we still use writing, not so much on the stone tablets, I'll admit, just as we still have libraries, just, just as we still have printing, the new approaches do not negate the old approaches. We can learn from, we can enhance, we can make use of those old approaches. But I think we add new approaches in at the end of the list there of what the new technology. And this is technologically deterministic. The way your school runs has changed because printing is available, has changed because the internet is available, has changed because computers are available. You didn't ask for those things. They're there and you've made use of them as educators. So just as we can still use the old approaches. There are new approaches which the new technology makes possible. I want to just deal with the P word here, the pedagogy thing, in case people get the wrong idea. It is somebody standing at the front and giving ideas to a group of people. If you look at the etymology of it, it comes from the ancient Greek for the pedagogos, the household slave, we know the feeling, who takes the children to the place where learning happens. So yes, the latter use is the person standing up and teaching, but the original use was the person who accompanied the child to the place where learning happens. And I think it's nice to return to that in part. A little bit of education technology to show you. A little bit of video if a video works. Anybody remember Skinner from their teacher training days? Behaviorism, stimulus, response, reward. I'm going to ask you a question. If you get it right, you get a biscuit. Well, biscuits are optional. But, you know, we'll say, well done. We'll give you points or something. This is his idea. Actually, not merely idea, he made the thing. The teaching machine. This is 1959, if memory serves. These young people are studying in a new way. Class in spelling. It might as well be arithmetic, or algebra, or grammar, or in fact anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine, a device which creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? What can they teach? Who prepares the material they teach? And how does this material differ from textbooks, lectures, and educational television? What impact will machine teaching have on school organization? Some of these questions can be answered in at least a preliminary way. And he goes on to answer those questions there. Isn't that wonderful, though? I don't know if you could figure out what was happening from the video, but you have question written on a little piece of paper. Child writes in the answer alongside that, cranks the handle round, computer shows them what the answer is, and they mark whether they got it right or wrong. And then we go on to the next question. And then we go on to the next question. Any of you who've used lovely products like Education City, Mathletics, and similar things targeted at the secondary phase, I'm going to ask you a question and tell you whether you got it right, and I'm going to ask you another question. And we're going to keep going through that. You know, some things, yes, we've got much better graphics than those, but the same idea there. I don't know, is there more to e-learning? Should there be more to online learning than that? Well, perhaps so. The technology is here now to do the adaptive learning design. You say where you want to go. It knows where you're traveling from. It has a good profile of you as a learner. And it comes up with the best route to take you from where you are now to where you've decided you want to get. There are problems along the way. You decide to go off at a tangent. Don't worry. It's building up a very detailed profile of you as a learner and will navigate you back on track so you still head to your destination. Computers are already really very good at that. Adaptive learning, learning analytics, predictive analytics, all of that sort of cluster of terms there. Who's excited about that vision for learning? Ooh. What's the problem with that? Why is that not exciting you? Anybody? Well, perhaps because it means that we may be out of a job. Yeah? Giving the next, deciding the next best thing for a learner to do. That's something which we're good at. We don't want the machines interfering with that part of our job. 
But perhaps because you, perhaps like me, think that there is more to learning than just working through a succession of highly ta tailored, highly individualized, highly personalized learning objects. There is more to it than answering questions, reading content, and answering questions on those content. Come back to the School of Athens, come back to the First Academy, and the conversation that takes place is the place where ideas are passed on, the information is passed on. Seymour Papert writing 34 years ago, in many schools today, the phrase computer-aided instructions means making the computer teach the child. One might say the computer is being used to program the child. This is kind of what Skinner was doing. I worry a little that about learning analytics, adaptive learning design is heading in that direction. In his vision, the child programs the computer, and in doing so, acquires a sense of mastery over a piece of the most modern and powerful technology, and establishes an intimate contact with some of the deepest ideas from science, from maths, and from the art of intellectual model building. That's what Janet's talking about. That's what I'm sure Tom's going to talk about, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's not part of Emma's um, conversation as well, about putting the pupil, the student, in charge of the computer, rather than putting the computer in charge of the child. And for me, I think that's a much more exciting vision for pedagogy. So how do we do that? Well, go back to your teacher training days and reread some of your Piaget about learning through experience. My daughter here, now three, was, I think, one and a half at the time the photograph was taken, already developing her mental schema of how the device in front of her works. She closes the lid and mummy or daddy pays attention to her is one of the first lessons she learned about technology. But knowing that when she bashes on the keyboard and moves the finger on the trackpad, the computer responds. Input, process, output is already part of her mental schema, even though neither of her very geeky parents have told her that. But we also have the conversation that's taking place around the technology. Look at Sigurd Dimitra's work there. Not a one-to-one -one deployment, but putting the computer and the internet connection into the hands of a group of four children. And it's the conversation that takes place around the tasks, around the puzzles, around the problems, around the questions, where the learning takes place, rather than merely the access to the content. And of course, four to one is much cheaper than one to one. And then, as Janet was talking about earlier, we learn so much through making things to show to others. This was Papert's great insight in terms of the logo programming work back in the 70s and 80s. It wasn't merely children learning through programming computers. The real insight was that we learn so much through making things to show to others. And this has been a big part of ICT education, big part of computing education, that we make something to show to others. Yes, it's nice when that's a computer program, but it's fine when that's a PowerPoint presentation, or an animation, or digital video, or a podcast, or a piece of digital photography. Making things to show to others such a powerful approach to learning using this technology. So, for instance, take Scratch. Lovely, lovely, easy-to-use programming toolkit. And here's one of my trainees' work, creating the drill and practice maths game, the sort of thing which Skinner was doing with his teaching machines we can now put into the hands of primary school trainee teachers. I'm going to ask you a multiplication question. If you get the answer right, I'll give you a biscuit. Otherwise, no biscuit, I'm afraid. But I keep doing that until you've got six of them right, or whatever the rubric in Sam's program here is. And this is something your pupils can make to show to others. And yes, the building block approach of Scratch is fabulous, but the best bit of Scratch isn't the building blocks. It's this menu up here, the share menu. Because part of Scratch right there in its foundation philosophy is that the work that they make they can share with a global audience. Okay, not all two and a half billion people on the web have a connection to the Scratch website or use the Scratch website. But that sense of an audience, the sense of writing, creating something for other people to see. I want to talk now a little about networks and this idea that we have information these little chunks of things about things or information about something. But it's actually when we connect the information together that we get from information to knowledge. And that at the heart of a pedagogy for the digital age is this idea of connections, about connecting 
neurons together, the brain science stuff, that actually, how can you say somebody has learned something in one of your lessons if their brain hasn't changed during the course of that lesson? That there are more neurons connected to neurons, or the connection between, or the existing connections between neurons is stronger than it was. If Esten are asking you to show evidence that your children have learned during this lesson, brain scan at the beginning, brain scan at the end, compare and contrast. There's the evidence, yeah? It's a very reductionist level. That's what learning has to mean. But what does that mean? Well, it's about connecting the ideas together. Think of my network diagram. And think about the different ideas. A good lesson, I would suggest to you, is one where new bits of information connect to existing information and strengthen those connections. And that's how a child, student's knowledge develops, because they're able to fit the new ideas into the place of the old ideas. I worry a little about some of what's happening to the side of the bridge, about facts, 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 just as grad grind had in hard times. Hmm. Dickens, appropriate title for a Dickens novel <laughs> about education at the moment. Um, but it's not merely facts. It's about connecting the new facts to the old facts. And of course, this also happens with us as teachers, with your students as learners. Yes, it's about connecting information, but it's also about connecting people together. And coming together on a day like this is a great opportunity for strengthening those connections or making new connections. Your knowledge develops as you listen to the conversations, the experiences of others. Make the most of the language thing, which we got right, you know, 600,000 million years ago, to share those experiences so you don't have to have all of that experience yourself. And of course, this is what we have with the technology. What's the difference between the internet and the web? Much more interesting to ask the question about what's the similarity between the internet and the web? And both are about connection. The internet is about connecting computers together, and you have all of these transatlantic cables or under-ocean under cables which connect our computers to their computers. The internet is about connecting all these computers together, network of networks. But Berners-Lee's genius was to go a stage further and to use the infrastructure of the internet to start connecting the documents together so that one page, one set of ideas, one collection of information is linked by the little angle bracket a, href equals the hyperlinks, the blue underlying text to other documents. That's why it's a web, because it's not just the documents, it's the connections between the documents where the knowledge exists. And of course, this is how Google works, and I imagine they, that it's because they have the index of the pages, they also have the index of the links there. And how come Google is so good at giving you, you know, when was the last time you had to look on page two? Top of the list there is the page which contains the words you looked for, which has the highest number of high quality inbound links. The page goes top of the list because loads of other pages are linked to it. In terms of digital pedagogy, yes, being able to find something on Google is great. You still need to know stuff so you can link that new bit of information to your old bit of information. And of course we've used the web for things which I'm sure Berners-Lee never imagined we would back in 89 at CERN. So this is a representation of the social graph of somebody's Twitter network, of the connections which we make use of, of the people we connect to using the web. If you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. It's a great place for sharing those ideas, for using language pass on that information to one another. And make the most of the technology you have in Hub and other online tools for connecting your learners together. Of course, you can do that in your classroom. But you can do that beyond your classroom too. Janet spoke about going agile with your approach, with the Welsh approach to curriculum design. And I think that's fabulous. I really do. But I think we can go agile with our approach to teaching Two. So Agile software development was, oh, sort of late 90s, really that kind of time where it catches on with a view that the previous way of sort of specifying functional requirements and then designing a system and then implementing that and checking it works and then having a sort of maintenance pack was fine as far as it went. 
but actually wasn't nearly as efficient, as effective as it could be as an approach to software development. So yes, the things on the left matter. Of course you should have a plan. Of course you should negotiate contracts. Of course you should document things. Of course you should have the right processes and the right tools. But actually a far better approach to developing software is about being responsive to change, is about collaborating with customers, is about getting software that works first and foremost, rather than writing the documentation, and about thinking about the individuals and the interactions between them. Now, that software development, translate that into our world. And how much of your time is spent with the things on the left? about planning things, about documenting things, about, yes, having the right process and tools. And how many of you actually came into teaching because of the things on the right, about the children in the room in front of you and your conversation with them, about developing their working knowledge rather than documenting everything that you do? Do you not think it's time that we moved our focus from something which was fairly waterfall in approach to something which was a lot more agile in approach. It's worth saying, oh, and this of course takes us back to great work like Plowden in, in 1967 talking about a child-centered education. Now, once in a while, saying to the children in the room in front of you about being agile and saying, not this is what you've got to learn, but what would you like to learn? And tailoring, tailoring your lessons around their interests and enthusiasms. So yes, SatNav is great for getting to the destination. There's an awful lot of countryside to explore on the way. More of that in a moment. Out of Agile grows this movement to software craftsmanship, which says, yes, responsive to change matters, but actually what we should be doing is steadily adding value. And yes, collaborating with our customers, children, pupils, matters. But what matters more is having productive partnerships, that being something that's useful for them. Yes, well, working software matters, but what you really want is well-crafted software. Writing the lesson, creating the lesson, which is as good as it gets, the one which you could laminate, if you ever thought it was right to laminate a lesson plan. English school minister, don't get me started. No, please, don't get me started. And yes, focus on the individuals and interactions in the room in front of you, but don't forget your responsibilities to the professional community that you're part of. CPD, great thing, continuing professional development. Think of it, too, though, as the continuing development of the profession and what you can contribute to that. Twitter is a great place for this. So, yes, in education, we tend to think of learning as a journey. This is the journey from Roehampton over to Cardiff. Okay, Google says two hours, 45 minutes. They don't get everything right. Okay, that we have learning. If we think of temporal metaphors. We have learning as a journey. We think of the lesson. We document that on a blog. We look at film as a metaphor, perhaps. We think of a set attainment in terms of levels. We have IT suites which look an awful lot, don't they? Like call centers. Is that really the limit of your ambition for your pupils' IT, to have an IT room which trains them to work in a call center? I hope not. I really would. Um, and in programming, we think very easily in terms of procedural language. Another set of metaphors exist. Think of learning more using spatial metaphors. Think of it as a landscape to explore rather than a journey to complete. Think of the library as the locus of learning rather than merely the classroom. How come we don't use wikis more? How come blogs have taken off so much and the wiki not so much? Open question of that. And yes, think about digital video and film, but also think about the non-linear artifacts such as games. And we're using badges to recognize achievement rather than merely working through a sequence of levels. And have an IT suite if you've got control over it, which looks a lot more like a design studio and a little less like a call center. Have that as your ambition for your pupils, making things rather than consuming things. And yeah, in programming terms, objects as well as procedures. Um, I'm sorry I've overran. I always do. Former head teacher. Nobody could tell me to stop during assemblies, and I sort of carried that into later work. Look, there's an email address jobby on screen. I vlog occasionally, not very much, and I'm on the Twitter quite a lot more than that. If you want to see the slides again, then uh, bit.ly slash diglit14cdf is the place where you'll find all of this on screen. Thank you so much for listening.